Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the WISE Zoominar today. Uh, we're going to have two great talks today. Uh, the first talk will be um, about the observations and modeling of waves in gusty winds uh, by uh, Dr. Christine Christy Hegermiller from the University of Washington. And the second talk will be the about the coupled data simulation within a coupled Earth system model uh, by Dr. Isabel Hutton from so far. Um, so Christy, please. Great, hi everyone. Uh, let me share my screen and see what happens here. Oh, you have two. Okay, can you see everything okay? Yes, great. Okay, great. Um, hi everyone, I'm Christy Hegermiller. I'm at the University of Washington in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Um, it's nice to see you all. Uh, it was really lovely to see some of you in person last week at Ocean Sciences, especially since I will not be at WISE this year and we'll get to miss the rest of the community. Um, so I'm grateful to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward today to sharing a little bit of work in progress that Jim Thompson at APL UW and I are doing to basically dig in through some old data to see if we can learn new things about how waves grow and evolve under gusty winds. So uh, to get started, um, oh, and I'll just mention one other thing. I unfortunately will uh, leave during the second half of this seminar to attend lecture. It's the last lecture um, or the last second to last lecture in my undergraduate class that I teach uh, and I need to be there. So unfortunately, um, I'll have to skip out, but hope to be able to have some nice discussion uh, at the end of this. So we're talking about waves and gusty winds. So we'll start with this shaky video that I found um, that some guy took um, in not too far away from where I am right now. This is from Port Townsend, Washington. So a video looking out on Puget Sound on a really gusty day. And I love this video, even though the waves are small, um, we can start to see small scale uh, roughness and capillary wave growth uh, due to gusty wind conditions. Um, and you can see kind of the, the wind was coming off the land and creating these really nice features. Of course, this is at a really small scale, uh, so Puget Sound, but if we scale this up to open ocean conditions, we could think about these different scales of um, wind variability in both time and space. And I'll just pause it briefly. Um, so wind can vary in magnitude and direction over a really wide variety of space scales and a wide variety of time scales as well. Um, this guy who filmed this video had this great name for these features that you see. He called them caterwillies, um, which I had never heard before, but I kind of like. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if we should use that moving forward maybe in the field, but it's it's kind of fun to think about that. Um, so the time scales that we're thinking about this wind variability in direction and magnitude are on the order of seconds to minutes. Uh, and the scales that we're thinking about can vary with the scales of the weather systems that are um, impacting a given area. So, you know, here it's really small scales over the open ocean. There's variability at larger spatial scales um, as well, you know, hundreds of meters, kilometers. Um, and the question that we're asking here is really how do waves evolve uh, and grow under these gusty wind conditions? So I will advance. Um, so our questions, how do waves grow and evolve in gusty winds? And the secondary question there is how do we parameterize the effect of gusty winds and wave growth under those conditions in wave models? Um, I'll jump a little bit to the conclusions from the work that we've done just to set us up. But basically what we see is that from our analysis of this diverse data set, uh, we have differences in both observed bulk and spectral characteristics of the wave field between when winds are gusty versus when they're not gusty. Um, and we can hopefully use some of these observations to then evaluate existing wave model parameterizations for gustiness or move forward to different wave model parameterizations for gustiness. So let's chat a little bit about uh, some of the hypothesis, uh, the, the ways that waves change and grow in gusty winds. Um, there's two primary hypothesized mechanisms for the effect of wind gustiness on wave growth. 
The first is called this wave age diode effect. And this was the first mechanism that was identified. And it's essentially that at these short timescales of wind variability, you can imagine that as winds are accelerating beyond the mean wind, um, they are uh, modulating basically the, the wave age uh, at this short time scale. And so as winds are higher than the mean, you know, the wave age decreases uh, temporarily and you can then input more uh, uh, growth into, into the wave field. Um, and the reverse is true on the other side uh, as winds are um, short, smaller or uh, lesser magnitude than the means you get this opposite effect. Uh, this was identified in some work by Abdallah and Cavallari in 2002, um, where they coined this term diode effect, and then it was discussed in some of the review papers that came out of WISE meetings um, later on. Uh, the second mechanism that was really recently proposed is a swell-gust coupling, um, and this was proposed by Lou et al. just last year, uh, where I'll talk a little bit more about their work as it was kind of motivation for what we dove into here. Um, but basically, they defined that there was kind of a similar uh, effect to swell modulation of short waves that gustiness has. And so they're preferentially modulating um, the short waves that are riding on top of long waves and allowing for wave growth uh, at that those uh, long wave crests. So let's talk a little bit about some of this work that Lou and L did because it was really nice and uh, it was a really clean data set and they got to look at some observations of differences between the wave field under uh, gusty and not gusty conditions. So um, these are just a few plots from uh, this recent work where they basically analyzed a three month long time series of uh, drifter observations in the Pacific Ocean during some tropical cyclones that went by. Uh, and so you've got really nice conditions to observe growth, uh, right, um, in strong, winds that are growing um, during those tropical cyclones. And they see that both for bulk wave conditions for significant wave height, um, there's a difference in the distribution of significant wave height, both over the total um, component of the wave field. And then if you look at just the C component of the wave field, and they show that, of course, there's a really nice relationship between uh, U10 and the significant wave height. They also, though, on the right, show that there are differences in the swell field as well um, between gusty and non-gusty conditions. And this, this uh, difference that they saw was what led to this hypothesis that there's this additional uh, mechanism for wave growth, which is this swell-gust coupling. They took a look at um, following, crossing, and opposing swell conditions as well, and saw differences across the board um, in, in the uh, significant wave height that was associated with the gusty and not gusty fields. Okay, um, and this work was really the, the um, motivation for us to kind of dive into a more diverse data set and see if we can see some similar patterns. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, I primarily come from a numerical modeling background and really interested in how waves uh, can be modeled over global and regional scales. And so, um, I'm also interested in thinking about how this wind gustiness can be parameterized. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about what's been done in that field so far. So we can think about wave growth by wind input, this S in term, which is proportional to the um, inverse wave age, square of the inverse wave age. And we see that the wind wave growth is a function of U star, right? Which is our um, wind friction velocity. And uh, Peter Janssen basically suggested in 1986 that this U star should be a function of not only the mean wind speed, but also some gustiness, some de deviation of the wind speed around its mean. Uh, and um, future work after that, you know, investigated the impact of basically synthetic wind fields with some randomness imposed on them uh, in a variety of different ways, you know, empirical orthogonal functions of wind fields, uh, uniform uh, and constant uh, variability, basically um, changes in like the way that we might, the time steps that we might use uh, in a numerical wave model to look at this impact of wave gusting or wind gustiness on waves. Um, and they found, you know, all of these idealized numerical experiments basically found that the impact was, was substantial. So uh, under, particularly gusty conditions, you might have increases in the wave height of you know, 20 to 30%, for example. 
Uh, and what this comes down to in the way that this is implemented in numerical wave models now is that we basically uh, include this enhanced wave growth term, which is uh, sigma uh, star, where sigma is the standard deviation of the wind speed or this gustiness metric. And we basically are trying to come up with this standard deviation of the friction velocity. Uh, so there's a couple of different ways that we could go about doing this. Abdallah and Cavallari introduced this relationship between um, this gustiness, the standard, you know, the standard deviation here, sigma, um, to the uh, air sea water temperature differences, uh, and then in ECMWF, uh, the IFS currently, uh, there's a parameterization that's based on basically like the uh, stability of the atmospheric boundary layer. And that's because gustiness uh, over the open ocean is related to this atmosp atmospheric stability. So in the context of, you know, a coupled model where you have an atmospheric component, you can easily derive uh, and, and use this Z I over L scale, which is this um, inversion scale over the Monin Obukov length scale. Uh, in the case where you don't have that information, you have to use something like an air-sea temperature difference to estimate what the atmospheric stability would be in this year when gustiness. Um, using this parameterization where we've got some wind gustiness parameterized by the air-sea temperature differences, um, Ab Abdallah and Cavallari implemented this within WAM, and then uh, later it was implemented in Watch 3 uh, and showed that if you look at this in the statistical sense on the right here, we've got some time series of uh, significant wave height where we have measurements in the dots. Um, and then this uh, kind of reference line uh, in the solid line, and then an ensemble of, since it's a statistical uh, approximation, um, in the hatching and then the dashed line above that. And you can see that the significant wave height that they predicted using this gustiness parameterization was actually quite a bit larger than if you had not included it. Um, okay, so last bit on how we model this. Um, some of you might remember from last year, I you know, was at SOFAR at the time and was interested in improving our global operational wave forecast. And we had run a series of experiments that included this enhanced wave growth um, in gusty winds term uh, parameterization. And we found that there were these reductions in the latitudinal gradients in our bias when we included both this term and some other terms that I won't talk about here, which just kind of suggested that maybe this is actually important um, and should be more regularly used within the numerical modeling world. However, um, we also then saw that if we looked at the uh, HS error in that global operational forecast relative to our uh, spotter network of observations, and we plotted this against the air sea temperature differences as an indication of you know, atmospheric stability and the types of um, errors that we were basically reducing um, within this new suite of simulations. This red line is showing um, down here that for unstable conditions, we actually ended up overcorrecting and producing this bias, um, positive bias in these uh, gusty conditions. And so our conclusions at the time were that, you know, the gustiness parameterization is impactful, but it also introduces some new forecast errors and thus could use some further investigation. Um, and uh, this was really the motivation for why we dove into some of the observations that I'm going to talk about next and why I, you know, why I was motivated to basically do this work, um, leading to figuring out why these parameterizations, um, how we might better improve these parameterizations. I won't actually return to this um, at the end of the talk because we haven't quite gotten there yet. So I'll just talk about our observations now. Um, okay, so what did we do? We basically aggregated observations from uh, four different past um, experiments that were using swift uh, buoys to observe both uh, air and sea conditions. Um, so these different experiments are shown on the left here. Uh, and they range from you know the past several years, basically, uh, in a variety of different ocean basins and a variety of different time periods, um, variety of different water depths, um, you know, wave conditions, uh, meteorological conditions, um, and so it's a, kind of a diverse data set relative to the one that Lou and all analyzed uh, for looking at this similar effect. And you know, we'd like to see if this 
these their results really hold for more broad data. Um, so if you're unfamiliar, the data that we're working with here is from these swift drifters, with the, which is the um, surface waves instrument float uh, and tracking. <laughs> Did I get that right? Um, and basically the critical components here are that there's a med station with a sonic anemometer at the top on a one meter mast above the wave following surface. Uh, these swifter groups have GPS tracking so we know where they are and a CT logger at depth um, as well. Uh, and you know there's a 1.25 meter uh, draft on these. Uh, so they're you know, semi Lagrangian floats basically. Okay, so the observations of interest from these data sets were the wind speed and standard deviation of the wind speed at one meters above the wave following surface, uh, the wave spectra and the bulk wave characteristics from these drifters as well. And we're looking at 12.5 minute averages of the data. Um, and we define this gustiness metric following previous work which is G naught, uh, where this is defined as the standard deviation of the wind speed, uh, which was calculated already for the 12.5 the minute burst that these swifts are observing um, over the mean uh, U10N actually uh, from that we derived from the core algorithm. So we chose the median of this value, this gustiness value for the entire data set as our threshold for gusty versus not gusty conditions. And that's also following previous work that used a median as, the, as this threshold. And important to note, we're not accounting for variability in direction here. It's really just variability in magnitude. Um, just to illustrate a little bit, these data are diverse, right? And so if we look at the PAPA 2019 data set, um, we can see that there's a variety of conditions. You know, we see pretty large uh, wind speeds during this experiment, but also a lot of uh, swell conditions during this experiment. Um, so that's important to note. Uh, if we take a look at the DigiFloat data on top of that, uh, this was actually uh, a shelf uh, mooring, um, continental shelf mooring for a couple months. And we can see that we observed, you know, pretty small waves during a large majority of that data set with small winds as well. The Norse 2021 experiment up here uh, observed a wider variety of conditions, including some really large storm events, which was pretty interesting. Um, and then the atomic cruise, which was in the um, tropical North Atlantic was kind of, in, I think in the summer and it you know, was pretty low wind speeds um, and wave heights as well. All right, so let's jump into what some of our results are. Uh, so if we take a look at just the uh, relationship between significant wave height and the U10N uh, for this data set and split the data between this by this gustiness metric, you know, splitting by that median value, uh, we see that the distributions of populations are separate, um, largely. We can take a look at the sea and swell conditions, as Lou and all did. And we find that the relationship, you know, for C, where we're basically looking at this um, relationship that looks like the square of the, the wind speed, which is great, uh, holds more so for just the C conditions versus our entire data set, which just points to the diversity in the conditions that we saw. And then, you know, the fact that there was a lot of swell and um, a lot of the data. Uh, but we really do across the entire range of conditions that we saw see this separation between gusty and, and not gusty conditions. And we see larger waves in gusty conditions than calm conditions for the same wind speeds. We also observe this separation of the um, wave heights for swell, but we haven't dove into that um, any more than we have here. And then I'll just point out, you know, that uh, there's some questions about what is going on at the high end of this um, curve in the sea, and there's potential that some of these uh, impacts that we're seeing are from sheltering of uh, the winds in large waves, right? We've just got a one meter mast. And so you can imagine that at high wind speeds, maybe we have some uh, sheltering going on, or maybe there's some swell contamination because I just separated this by uh, wave age. Um, so it could be uh, imperfect, but nonetheless, we still see these differences. And just to bring back up Lou et al's uh, results, you know, showing a really similar distribution, especially at the lower wind speeds, uh, which is where our, our observations kind of overlap the most. We can also take a look at some of the uh, spectral wave characteristics between gusty and not gusty conditions. 
And we see that for um, the same, so what I've done here is I've like binned uh, the spectra for five meter per second bins of winds um, and they're changing in time. So for the same wind speeds, we see that the evolution of the spectra or the, the spectra that we have um, are pretty different for gusty and not gusty conditions. There's greater total energy in the gusty versus calm conditions, which we already knew from the significant wave height. There's also just more rapid development in gusty versus calm conditions. And so we can see this earlier frequency downshifting um, and just larger growth of the peak uh, of the spectrum as well. Uh, if we look at the equilibrium range, uh, there's potentially some changes in the evolution of the spectral tail, but uh, I think that the data is a little bit inconclusive, even though I'm kind of really curious that this is there. Um, and some earlier analysis that I had done with a little bit more rigorous data processing had shown that there was potentially an earlier shift from equilibrium to saturation um, at lower wind speeds in gusty winds, but I'm not confident that that is actually a result just yet. Uh, we can also take a look at some other aggregated metrics um, of the uh, spectrum. And so we decided to look into the mean square slope, which is the fourth mo moment of the wave spectrum and is related to basically a metric of the steepness of the wave field and, and the roughness, um, and therefore is important for uh, air sea fluxes, right? example. So we've calculated mean square slope, but now we can look at the relationship between uh, mean square slope and the wind speed here for these different distributions of gusty and not gusty conditions. And we see that they are separated in space, right? There's a lot of overlap, but um, for every single bin of wind speed, the gusty conditions have a steeper or higher mean square slope than the not gusty conditions. Um, we also see evidence for this um, saturation or roll off of mean square slope, which is consistent with some results from work that Jake Davis has done um, here in our group uh, at UW um, and has presented to the WISE community as well. And so we see this evidence for saturation at high wind speeds. And one of the questions that we'd like to pursue is, does this mean square slope saturate at lower wind speeds in gusty conditions compared to calm um, conditions? And just to, just to show Jake's work here, um, you know, one of the questions that we're interested in asking is basically, you know, he showed this nice relationship between the wind speeds and the mean square slope for a bunch of uh, buoy observations in different hurricane conditions. And one of the questions is, well, does gustiness contribute to some of the scatter in the vertical here? Um, and is that, a, you know, a secondary effect that we might pursue a little bit further? So to wrap up, because I see Morteza has turned on his video again, um, you know, the question that we're asking is how do waves grow and evolve in gusty winds? We'd ultimately like to get to wave model parameterizations, but we're not quite there. This is really work in progress. But what we do see is that over a really diverse range of conditions, a broad data set that isn't as clean um, as some others that have been analyzed, we still get uh, differences in both the bulk and spectral characteristics of the wave field in gusty and not gusty winds. Um, and hopefully we can kind of dive into the growth rates uh, of some of the waves um, in this data set to evaluate some of the wave model parameterizations. Um, okay, and then I guess I'll just leave us with this great video of these caterwillies uh, one more time and and say thank you and, and happy to have a chat uh, about any questions. Thanks very much, Christy. Yeah. It was a great talk, really enjoyed it. Um, we have time for a few questions. You can either just uh, unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, Suzani, please. Hi, Christy, thanks a lot for this uh, interesting talk. Uh, my question would be, um, normally the statistical parameters are based on the assumption of stationarity. And when you have gusty winds, I guess you can no longer assume stationarity. How, how do you deal with this? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> we did not deal with this here um, in this work. We basically uh, assumed that over these, maybe over these uh, these 12.5 minute you know, windows, there was maybe some approach towards stationary. But you're totally right. And I think that that is, a, that is kind of the point. Is that right? Like the waves are going to be constantly evolving to the wind speed when you have this dustiness um, and you might not reach a, a, an equilibrium there. 
sorry, that's not a satisfying answer, but we- No, thanks a lot. It's a difficult question. <laughs> yeah. Um, Hendrik? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. hi, Hendrik. Excellent. Uh, so uh, thank you, Christy. A very nice presentation. Uh, I know you and I talked about this before a little bit too with uh, with the stuff I did with trying to get the response behavior out of the wave model. Uh, yeah. So um, three minor things. Uh, one, um, a lot of this Gustiness impact was uh, um, coming out of the work of uh, Kimo Kama and Charles Kalkun. And so, uh, of course, they were looking only at fetch limited uh, idealized conditions, but I would love to see how you can, if and how you can link your observations to uh, basically the range of change of growth that they saw. Yeah. And so so that will be cool to see if that works. Yeah, uh, I, I did do some initial um, analyses with like really isolating conditions that seemed like they weren't impacted by swell and there was growth um, and trying to look at growth rates there. Uh, but it really limits the data set because it is so diverse. It just wasn't a perfect data set for that. But I'd love to dive into that a little bit more. Yeah. So sec second one is kind of for the record. Um, uh, I, I, I love all the uh, all the old uh, references uh, of uh, the work that uh, that Peter and Jean and uh, uh, Luigi and uh, uh, others were doing. Um, one of the other early things uh, is something that was actually in the original Wave Watch was um, uh, uh, taking a Bill, Bill Richardson's number and then uh, defining an effective wind speed rather than a than a neutral wind speed. Um, and so uh, I personally don't know if that is going to work a long time from the work I did the last year or two. I don't think it has the right behavior of it, but it would be interesting to see uh, uh, if that is something that you could uh, could uh, squeeze out of your data, uh, yeah. particularly the idea of, uh, of using the bulk Richardson number as a uh, stability parameter and whether or not uh, it is something that you can uh, fold back into scaling behavior. And yeah. then, yeah. I wrote it down, thank you. And then uh, uh, last but not least, uh, um, uh, are you willing to share your slides? Yeah, of course. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing up my stuff and I wanna make sure that I refer to your work and to some of the, the recent references that you have in there. So I will be much appreciated. And again, yeah. all the talks, Henrik, uh, everybody, the, these going to be uh, available on YouTube channel, the Wise in our YouTube channel. So, yeah, I'm lazy. <laughs> okay, we have uh, one more question, Victor, please. <clears throat> Just um, a, a small comment. So, I was also working on um, gusty winds with Sergei Aninkov. And but but we were interested in uh, we also found uh, that uh, <clears throat> uh, under gusty wind uh, wind uh, uh, waves um, grow <clears throat> faster. But we were interested in in, in the uh, more fundamental issue. So <clears throat> whether um, we, you could apply a Hasselman equation at all. So uh, <clears throat> when the scales are um, <clears throat> when you have intermittency. Uh, at much shorter scales, uh, yeah. and um, and we uh, did direct numerical simulation and uh, and compa and um, compared this to uh, and found that uh, uh, indeed the evolution uh, uh, <clears throat> um, okay follows prediction of um, Hasselman uh, kind of Hasselman type equation, but with effective wind. Okay. And I will put this uh, uh, paper on uh, on chat now. Thank you. So. Great. That would Thanks. be great. Any other question? I think, uh, especially because uh, we won't have Christy at the end of the the session. If you have any other question, please, Henry. Yeah, just 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 yeah, a thought. From, just from a, a thought from. Uh, observations I made uh, sitting and uh, at the Chesapeake Bay 20 years ago when uh, Hurricane uh, uh, Isabel came came by. Uh, that was an uh, incredibly good uh, uh, observation set. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't make any movies of that, uh, mm -hmm. of the fact uh, that you had these uh, these uh, fluctuations 
that are perhaps a little bit beyond gustiness, but with uh, rain bands coming through and very different, yeah. um, uh, very different, still short time scale things coming through. And so it will be kind of interesting to see if you can expand on time scales on not just quote unquote gustiness, but sort of how the transition is. But yeah, my observation, my my observation there also was that this is something that you uh, might want to look at uh, in shallow water also as a combined uh, wave surge issue, uh, because yeah. I, I noted that that um, on my beach every time a rain band came through the water level went up four inches or five inches discreetly almost, and then stayed right. the, same, the next next band etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Sorry. Right. I think those are meteor tsunamis, right? I don't like that term. Okay. <laughs> sure. uh, it, it's 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 just uh, uh I don't like that term uh, uh, because the, the, there is a continued uh, a continuum of scales that you're looking at, and these in this specific uh, in, in in this specific uh, case of the of a hurricane coming through, they were basically band structure. I will not right. call them meteor tsunamis in that sense. Fair. Yeah. Thanks very much for the comments. Uh, any other question? All right, I have one more uh, quick comment or general thought, uh, like a uh, fundamental question. Chrissy, do you think uh, we could use other parameters to represent gustiness? Definitely. In addition to, uh, you know, sigma? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, and others have used other um, ways to calculate that gustiness. Um, we just didn't do that here, mostly because this standard deviation of the wind speed was actually already calculated for F everything in the data set. Um, so we didn't go back and look at uh, the raw time series of the wind, basically. But I am very curious about that because I think that the results are sensitive to this, what we've chosen here. All right. So I'd be happy to chat more about that with you. Sure. Uh, all right. Thanks very much, Christy. Please reach out to Christy. Uh, you see the e her email. Uh, so if you have more questions, uh, please reach out directly to her. All right. Okay, um, thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, so we're our next talk is about data assimilation uh, using the data improving the the forecasting by um, Isabel Hutton. Isabel, please. All right, thank you, and thanks for kicking this off, Christy. Um, can everybody can everybody see my screen? Okay. Yes, it's great. Great. Um, so I'm Isabel Houghton. I, I work at SOFAR, and I'm excited to talk today about um, using observations toward improving uh, forecasts, specifically within a coupled Earth system model um, and relying on uh, coupled data simulation. And so this is work done with the rest of the team at SOFAR, as well as has a lot of contributions from Christy's time at SOFAR, as she mentioned um, earlier in her talk. So today I'll talk a little bit about the motivation behind a coupled Earth system model, as well as the motivation behind utilizing strongly coupled data simulation. And I'll go into a little bit more what I mean when I say strongly coupled data simulation. And then this is really a multi-year uh, research and development project at SOFAR. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the initial um, progress that we have made and where we really are looking forward um, to going into the future. So why a, a fully coupled Earth system model? Um, I think most of us are, are on board with this at this point, but you know, historically there has oftentimes been these standalone models for each domain, um, such as you know, if you're running Wave Watch 3, just driving it with uh, external winds, say from, from GSF, GFS or from, from uh, ECMWF. Uh, but if you think about the, the dynamics across all these domains, um, they're really strongly coupled and have a lot of feedbacks. And so um, I think the, the most relevant one to this group would be thinking about wave atmosphere processes, and how uh, winds obviously driving that wave growth, but as those waves grow larger and larger, um, an increase in surface roughness will have really meaningful impacts on the atmosphere. Um, and that will of course in turn lead to a feedback back to the waves. And so there's you know, innumerable uh, processes here that we would like to capture um, by coupling uh, a wave model such as WaveWatch 3 with, a, with an ocean model such as MOM6 and an atmospheric model such as um, FP3. People have, have worked on this uh, previously and demonstrated uh, really meaningful impacts when you start to add all these couplings. Um, so this is a figure from Wu et al. in 2019. 
uh, where the left column is uh, an atmosphere only run uh, where you have these surface winds in this uh, northern Norwegian region. Um, and then as you move through each column, um, you can see the, the impact of adding an additional coupling. So that second column adding atmosphere wave, you see kind of these open ocean changes in, in wind speed, um, atmosphere ocean leading to some even larger um, changes that are also really seasonally dependent. Um, and then adding that, that wave ocean coupling, that last column, um, once again, more modifications to the, the wind speeds. Um, and of course, you know, modifications to the wind speeds will cascade down to all of the other uh, variables we're trying to predict um, and, and accuracy toward um, forecasts. And so why do we care about this at so far? Um, for those of you who have seen any of my, my previous WISE talks, I'm really focusing on uh, improving wave forecast skill. And so what I'm showing here is a figure from some previous work that is demonstrating uh, wave forecast skill with data assimilation. And what you can see is the, the gray line indicates um, the root mean squared error as a function of lead time when we don't have any data assimilation. So just running um, kind of the, the wave model um, on its own. And then uh, the pink and the blue lines indicate two different data assimilation methodologies. And the key takeaway here is really just that when you start to look at two to three day lead time, we're really starting to rapidly um, converge back to that baseline root mean squared error, meaning that the impact from observations within our wave model is not really persisting out. Um, like we really have this, this forecast horizon. And the hope would be that within a, a fully coupled system, the impact um, that we have in assimilating observations in, um, in, in real time would actually feed back into the atmosphere and into the ocean and therefore um, this more chaotic system, um, in, including the atmosphere wave and ocean would actually propagate out into the future with more accuracy because we initialize it more accurately. So as I mentioned, uh, so far we're really focused uh, historically on uh, wave modeling. And so we, we've published uh, a lot of work in terms of the impact of assimilating our global spotter network, as well as other um, altimeter measurements on our operational wave forecast system. Um, and that's WaveWatch 3 run at a uh, global scale at quarter degree resolution. But where we're going and, and where we're at right now in, in research and development is toward a fully coupled system. And right now we have an atmosphere wave coupled system relying on um, the SHIELD framework with FE3 dynamical core um, with a lot of assistance from, from GFDL there. And so by coupling the atmosphere and the, the wave system, um, we now have a lot more control over also these interactions um, and, and these physics that, that Christy has also spent a lot of time um, looking into as well as um, developing during her time at so far. So, um, in this Earth system model, we have the atmosphere coupled to a land model, which is how FV3 is set up. Um, it interacts with the mediator that also interacts with our, our Wave Watch 3 model. Um, and in this current system where we don't have an ocean model yet spun up, um, we are still sourcing high comm currents um, in order to accurately represent um, some degree of, of wave current interactions. And what we're doing is we're taking uh, from the atmosphere uh, the, the neutral winds, that surface air density, and that air sea temperature difference in order to uh, implement those gustiness parameterizations um, and instability to uh, the wave model. And then we're feeding back the Charnoff parameter um, from the wave model to the atmosphere. Um, and within the atmospheric model, it actually takes the Charnoff parameter and has a, a, a more refined method for estimating Z0, that rough, roughness length, than the, the wave model itself. And so consequently, every um, exchange step, um, which is uh, every exchange step, we're able to um, basically reassess the impact of the underlying waves on the atmosphere and the atmosphere on the underlying waves. So practically speaking, uh, where we're at is we have uh, this 13 kilometer resolution uh, atmospheric model set up and coupled to a quarter degree WaveWatch 3 um, spectral wave model. And the atmospheric model we actually have at 33 vertical levels instead of 137, which is the typical full vertical resolution. Um, but this is actually chosen to optimize for accuracy really near um, the surface boundary layer. So we're focused on observations at the air-sea interface, whether that's surface waves or other variables. And so in, in setting up this fully coupled model, we look to optimize toward um, that planetary boundary region uh, and, and less toward um, the high atmosphere. 
um, right now we're initializing with ECMWF, ECMWF initial conditions. Um, and what I'm showing right here is just the initial um, outputs without, um, without DA. And I would say maybe don't dig too much into these skill plots other than to say we can run a variety of different experiments uh, tuning how we uh, implement neutral winds, roughness, and air density. Um, and you can see you know, meaningfully large differences um, globally um, for, for wind speeds. And when we assess root mean squared air as a function of lead time, we're very competitive with the ECMWF HRES, um, meaning that we can basically take their initial condition and the model is, is well set up to, to replicate that, that uh, model spill from ECMWF. But that said, we're, we're running at lower vertical resolution. And we also now have the capacity to apply data assimilation, meaning that our initial condition in theory can actually be more skillful and hopefully propagate that skill out into the future. And so and I'll, I'll, I'll spend the rest of the talk um, focusing more on um, the data assimilation aspect. And so the, the coupled earth system model really being a vehicle for us to have control over um, assimilating as many observations as possible. And this really comes back to the, the motivation at so far of having this global network of observing buoys. So it's the spotter buoy shown there in the lower right. And we have on the order of 500 um, free drifting buoys reporting hourly globally at any given time where every gold pentagon on this map is an individual spotter buoy. And so with all those observations, we then want to utilize them as effectively as possible to improve uh, our initial condition to our coupled earth system model and see how impactful it is in terms of propagating out um, within all of, while still capturing all of those, those feedbacks. And so the, the spotter buoy, um, while historically really focused on measuring the surface wave spectrum, also measures a lot of uh, various other critical parameters at that air-sea interface, including sea surface temperature, barometric pressure. Um, we also can infer the wind and infer currents. And so with all those observations, along with all of the other observations uh, obtained from satellites, from Argo and other in-situ instruments, um, we then, the, the general um, architecture here is to aggregate all of the observations available across all these domains and, and es estimate um, errors for each of those domains. And then uh, comes in the, the tool of strongly coupled data assimilation, um, which is the concept of taking errors from all domains or, and utilizing them uh, in updating each domain. Um, and I recognize I'm saying kind of the same, you know, use errors from every domain, update every domain. Um, and hopefully I can give maybe a more tangible example of that um, with the idea, you know, focused on waves. So the, the spotter buoy measures the surface wave spectrum. As a result, you can estimate the wind sea at any given location. And so we could compare our spotter wind sea um, observation to our WaveWatch 3 wind sea estimate, and we'll see some error. In, in certain regions, we might see very large errors. And when we have a coupled Earth system model, we can actually understand the, the correlation between errors in our atmospheric model and errors in our wave model. And you would expect to have very strong correlation between the, the local wind sea and the overlying winds in your atmospheric model. And so the key here is that if, as long as correlations exist across our dom domains, and we expect that they should, um, you can take any observation as long as you can compare it to your model and utilize it to update all of the other domains that are correlated. And so this has been shown um, to be effective across different coupled um, setups. And, and what I'll show here is work from Sluka et al, where uh, improvement is shown on these color maps uh, in blue. And the, the output, this is outputs from assimilating atmospheric observations only into an ocean model. And so what you can see is when you just take atmospheric observations such as um, wind speed um, and, and air temperature, you get changes in um, the, the salinity and the temperature um, as a function of depth and globally. Uh, as well, if you look on the, the right side, you see changes, once again, looking back at the atmospheric variables, um, you get improvements in those sur surface atmospheric fields due to feedbacks between the atmosphere and the ocean. And so this general premise of taking improving um, observations in one domain and all domain or improving estimates of your initial condition in, in all your domains using observations 
um, should then allow you to improve all of the other domains. And as I've mentioned, this is really fundamentally reliant on the premise of, of correlations of errors between different variables and, and across domains. And so what I'm showing here is uh, very recently submitted work from Da et al. Um, that is just plotting the, the correlation between um, at any given latitude and longitude between one variable and another variable or the, the errors of um, one variable and another variable. And what I mean by errors is basically the deviation from the ensemble mean. So if you have uh, 50 representations of you know, the ocean surface and 50 representations of the atmospheric surface, um, the perturbation from the mean, um, you can then look at the correlations of those perturbations and see, uh, um, make a, a, a plot like this. And so um, there are some relatively like intuitive ones where SSU is sea surface um, U velocity and U10. And so you have a, a really strong positive correlation. Uh, and this makes intuitive sense. There's a lot of wind driven flow at the, the surface of the ocean. But there's some maybe more um, valuable ones that you can really think about through the lens of utilizing strongly coupled data simulation such as sea surface temperature and U10. So it's it can oftentimes be really challenging to get um, uh, global observations of, of U10 uh, wind speed that are really uh, accurate, but we do have a lot of in situ methods for getting sea surface temperature in certain regions. Um, and because you have these strong correlations, either positive or negative, you can actually use uh, an observation of sea surface temperature in theory to improve your, your wind velocity. And how this, this works um, goes back to some of the, the talk I gave last year uh, at WISE. Um, is reliant on the uh, any ensemble based method. Specifically, we work with the local ensemble transform common filter, um, and that effectively uses this ensemble to estimate both cross covariances across uh, variables and spatial error covariances. So, how does um, if you observe an error at one latitude and longitude, what is the the likely model error, say 100 kilometers away? And you can use um, your ensemble to estimate that. Um, and effectively what you arrive at is this uh, common gain matrix, which allows you to uh, basically distribute your departure, which is the difference between your observation and your model background. So say a difference in significant wave height observed or a difference in barometric pressure and apply that to your model background to arrive at a model analysis. So I'm not sure how much time I have left, but um, with the, the last few minutes, I'll talk a little bit about some of the examples under development. Uh, the ultimate vision, as I've described, is really taking all observations from all domains and simultaneously updating the initial condition such that you have this consistent analysis. Uh, but on the roadmap, you know, to get there is making sure that each of those domains respond properly to assimilating all of these observations. And so what, I, what I've shown previously is applying LATKF in the wave domain. Um, and the, the biggest takeaway being um, those spatial error covariances estimated from the ensemble um, are really valuable in distributing the, the observations in space. And so what I'm showing is the difference in um, uh, significant wave height uh, following uh, an assimilation update. And, and the key takeaway is that you get these really coherent, physically realistic updates um, that, that balance model uncertainty with your observations. And this is in contrast to optimal interpolation where you have um, really these blobby updates that aren't uh, physically representative of um, the underlying um, model state. Okay. Um, and the, one of the, the big values of having these physically realistic updates is that you end up being able to um, correct uh, features with, with sharper gradients. And while this is valuable for, you know, some sort of uh, something like a, a swell front, um, this can also be particularly valuable for other variables that have are, are less smooth in space. So waves and barometric pressure oftentimes have relatively smooth features, but um, wind fields and, and other things like that can oftentimes have sharp fronts and therefore um, having a, the capacity to update with physically realistic um, spatial covariances is, is particularly valuable. So I'm showing this plot here um, just to tie us back to the beginning of the talk of um, the, the challenge of, yes, wave LATKF works, works great alone, but ultimately we want to couple this to the atmosphere um, so that we can move past that, that forecast skill horizon. 
and so this is really preliminary work um, where we're trying we're basically bridging into atmospheric DA and we're really starting by focusing on the southern ocean um, utilizing LATKF to take barometer observations from spotters to update the entire atmospheric um, initial condition. So this is looking at a bunch of southern ocean um, spotter barometer observations. And when we apply the exact same um, algorithm as I described above, so the LATKF algorithm, you can get departures that look like this, now looking at um, surface pressure rather than um, surface waves. Uh, and once again, we're getting these physically coherent updates um, that are reflective of the underlying features that we see. Well, how do we actually update the entire three-dimensional uh, atmospheric field? Once again, relies on, as I mentioned, those spatial error correlations. And so what I'm showing here is we're updating at this point, and we can look at the correlations as a function of um, height in the, in the atmosphere and as a function of a slice in latitude and longitude. And what you see is kind of this spatial um, correlation blob around the location that we're at that does have variability north to south, east to west. And that all comes from the statistics within your ensemble that allow you to update um, Z, so the geopotential within our um, entire 3D field, just as a function of surface pressure, uh, where Z isn't just you know a function of surface, surface pressure, it's a function of also temperature and humidity in the atmosphere. I'm showing this figure as it's a clear indication of future work. Um, when you do update a, um, a, an atmospheric model with a large increment, so a large um, basically change um, to something like surface pressure, you do excite external gravity waves. Um, and this is a known problem for uh, atmospheric data simulation that we're working to, to alleviate. Um, and I, I can happy to talk about this more, but I see Morteza is on and that we're probably hitting time. So I'll, I'll mainly stop here um, with this summary being, um, we're really motivated to implement an, a coupled earth system model in order to capture all those feedbacks and to most effectively utilize all the observations that we have in order to propagate forecast scale out into the future as far as possible. And this has relevance of course to improved wave um, forecast skill, particularly as we can leverage more and more observations, um, such as partitioning across sea and swell. We have a lot of work to do as well, um, but I think there's a lot of promising signal in terms of these observations being really valuable across all these domains. So with that, um, I will wrap up and definitely please reach out with any, any questions if you're not able to ask in the remaining time that we have. All right, thanks very much, Isabel. Um, great talk. Uh, um, we have a uh, few minutes, a uh, couple of questions, please. Um, you can put it in the chat. Okay, John, please. Hi, Isabel. Uh, very nice talk. Um, my question, or my, it's an Andrew's question. How soon do you think your team will be working on impact of wave data in the atmospheric system. I've been screaming that at my own place, but they don't listen. So I need to have people who show me that it's nice impact <laughs> or has potential impact. On paper, it has, but yeah. I, I'm confident are you that you could tackle this relatively soon. Absolutely. And that's exactly where we want to go is, um, you know, I was really only able to show two examples of it implementing this data simulation within the, the coupled system. But once we can get to, um, there, there are many experiments to be run and one of them is very much just update, you know, your wave initial condition and assess the impact to the atmosphere two, three days into the future. Um, and, and as I alluded to, I think also, you expect there to be very strong correlations between errors in your wind sea and errors in your overlying winds. And if we can correct for those with our just our wave observations, um, that can meaningfully contribute to skill in regions where you just don't otherwise have any observations. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat from Son. Um, so the question is, did the method improves TP forecast uh, uh, consistently after the assimilation of HS? That is what we saw in general. Um, we also, 
I think I think we have a, a lot of runway in front of us to more uh, thoroughly improve the, the peak period. Um, so this first example is assimilating just significant wave height, but we do have spectral observations from the, the spotter buoys. And so what we've done historically using optimal interpolation is actually update um, energy as a function of frequency within the wave model um, as observed by the those spotter buoys. So I think while yes, we do see an improvement in peak period just because we're starting to get a better representation of um, where the energy is at and that propagates outward, um, there's a lot more we can do in assimilating spectral quantities and not just total bulk quantities. Does that answer your question? Looks like it, yeah. Any other questions? Unfortunately, we don't have Christy. We have four more minutes, uh, but um, so. <clears throat> okay, so one more question um, from Elias. Um, can you give some indication of computational efficiency difference between non-coupled and coupled approach? That's a good question. I can mainly speak to uh, historically, we really ran a WaveWatch 3 model and ingested external wind fields to force that. The computational efficiency of that was, was quite high. We were able to do that relatively efficiently. Once we switched to running a full atmosphere and wave coupled system, um, that jump is, is much, much larger than running it coupled versus uncoupled. Um, in terms of actual numbers, I can, I'm happy to respond with actual, I'm not gonna try to recall them off the top of my head. Other than that, we are building a lot of infrastructure to rely on parallel computing resources um, and, and batch processing, as well as using things like spot instances on AWS, which basically allows you to like spin up a job and, and just do some portion of that parallel task. So I think absolutely the computational challenge here is, is quite high. Um, but we are simultaneously working on that while also trying to implement a lot of the science. Awesome. Henrik, please. Yeah, so I wasn't going to say this, but uh, uh, in, a in a month or so at the European Central Conference, I'm actually wanting to talk a little bit about that from a strategic perspective. Uh, and so we made specific choices to make coupling easy to begin with. But we need to go. We need to go to a next generation of coupling to make these things efficient. But uh, anyhow, that was uh, that was just a little bit of a side note. I, I had a, a little bit more of a of a philosophical question. Um, the original data simulation um, approaches, like uh, going all the way back to Bauer uh, with for waves, uh, with the green functions approach, were really going to you have to change the wind fields rather than the wave parameters to have a uh, persistent impact on uh, on the wave data. And then, of course, looking at, uh, at the fact that uh, uh, we figured out that it really is a, a filter function rather than a, uh, than a scaling behavior in this, uh, which may not make that very effective. Um, so what you're doing here is basically simultaneously change, wanting to change the winds and the waves. Um, and so from the, from the, from the uh, sort of uh, more more philosophical perspective uh, do you see uh, whether the impact on the waves is bigger by the direct wave assimilation or by the changing of the forcing uh, through the coupled uh, uh, assimilation or have you looked at that uh, do you have any any uh, feeling for which parts are the most important uh, because I I realize that your your doing some really neat new stuff and you probably haven't answered all your questions yet. Yeah, I think that's a great question is exactly top of mind for us as well. We don't have, you know, concrete answers on that as we haven't been able to run that, that, you know, exact comparison. My intuition would be that in the early hours, so 12 to 24 hours, the direct assimilation of wave observations is going to be way more impactful than a correction of the winds. We're going to be able to, particularly thinking about regions that are observation sparse, which is really the angle that we go of, you know, previously unobserved, therefore not corrected yet. And um, with any observation and an immediate update, we can then um, much better capture both the sea and the swell fields out there. I think as we reach that, two to three day time, um, having the 
wave observation update that atmosphere or an atmosphere ob observation fix um, the atmosphere as well is really going to be the more impactful part. Um, at, at two to three days, we're really only able to correct things like a swell field that's then propagating over very large distances. Um, and in terms of kind of total energy and regions that we care about that, that gets smaller and smaller. So I think it's really the, a matter of time scales, and it's like the combination of both of those that compound each other, uh, particularly in having a very consistent update across the wave and the atmosphere, so that they're not at odds. Yeah, I, I would I would want to remark that uh, that by doing the L LTKF approach through actual uh, getting the co the covariances out of out of modeling results rather than out of scaling lo loss is uh, is really important considering the fact that we probably underestimated the, the 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 filter behavior of the models to begin with and from a from a practical perspective um wave da at an operational center like ours has been sort of in and out because of the fact that it's not an initial value problem and so if we can figure out ways of getting particularly in the pacific uh the da to significantly improve uh, a swell close to generation area uh, we're talking about specific signals that could last in the model for two weeks uh, and that are very specific uh, uh, geared towards uh, uh, harbor management and stuff like that on the U.S. West Coast. So there, there are, there are uh, uh, specifically even in the wave side, if you can do this, uh, the the swell pro the swell assimilation better. There, there is a potential big, both commercial and <laughs> safety of life and property type of uh, impacts uh, for both uh, uh, your commercial side and from for my weather service side. So I'm looking forward to seeing how far you can take this. All right. Yeah. Thanks very much for all the comments and discussion. We're uh, running out of time. Uh, I would like to thank you uh, again, bo both speakers, Isabel and Christy. And um, thanks everybody for attending this seminar. So um, awesome. Thank you so much.